I'm Mary Rose, author of the Inquiring Minds interviews on California Catholic Daily, speaking with Father Joseph Ilo of Star of the Sea Parish in San Francisco about his July 6th blog, Dispatches from the Front. Father Ilo's blogs can be found at fatherilo.blog.com. In your most recent blog, Father, you talked about someone telling you that the church had lost the culture war. Is that is that actually possible for us, for the church, to lose the culture war? Or is that, will the church at some point prevail? Or could, it, could we actually lose? Well, to say that, I mean, good point. Thank you for bringing that up. The gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. So I guess the church can't lose. I'm sure the church can't lose. But we can lose battles. And so it's better to say that <clears throat> the church has lost a battle. There's been a battle for people's hearts and minds. And it's, if not lost, we've certainly lost a lot of ground, but the war has been won. So to talk about a culture war is a bit improper. There are cultural trends and cultural battles but the war has been won on Calvary. We have to be quite convinced of that. I guess that's what I was, I was thinking, you know, in the end times, yes, Christ, Christ the King will come as victor. But I guess what I was wondering is, is it possible for us to lose before he comes? Like could the whole world descend into chaos before the end times? I mean, yeah, before the actual end time chaos. Um, or or will the church always, even in, in time, before the end of time, will the church always not quite lose? I am of the conviction that the church will always not quite lose. <laughs> because of what the Lord said, the gates of hell will not completely you know, prevail, meaning completely eradicate the faith. There will be times of great emptiness, like in anybody's spiritual life. The church universal will suffer her passion and abandonment, seeming abandonment by God what, you know, right from the cross. We will experience what our Lord experienced in, to some degree, in some analogous way. Why have you forsaken me? I'm reading a lot of John of the Cross lately, and he went through the sense of abandonment, of darkness, which led to a greater uh, presence of God. So <clears throat> with any marriage, I'm doing a lot of weddings lately, and I am I can see what's going to happen to these, these young people, <laughs> that they will go through great darkness. But if they hold on, they persevere to the end, they, they will save their marriages, they will save their souls. So the church, as well, like a marriage or like any personal interior life, has seasons. And it does seem we're in a kind of a winter time right now in, in the faith, at least in this country and, and in Europe. But you, no power on earth can reverse the grace that God won for us with his son's sacrifice on the cross. So in all of our battles, the blog post I wrote was written in dispatches from the front uh, about the culture war in a sense, or the, the battle that uh, Christians all must face against their own demons and darknesses and, and against the darkness outside of them. But the the battles always have to be fought with the conviction of final victory. World War II, I, I wrote about uh, the battle for Normandy in my post because we had just visited those sites, those beaches in Normandy. But every soldier understood that the war what would be won by the Allies. Every soldier was convicted of that. Even most of the German soldiers knew that it was only a matter of time. The Japanese bombing Pearl Harbor, the Germans invading Russia, 
opening a new front. It was really madness. They, any intelligent strategist would know that you can't win a war like that. You wake America up, even the, the Japanese commander said, we have waked a sleeping giant in bombing Pearl Harbor that will certainly bring about our destruction. So it is with the spiritual war, there's no question that a final victory, but we will lose some battles in, in the sense of having to retreat and losing, losing souls. Our, Our Lady Fatima showed the children the vision of hell with all the souls that were lost. And she said they're lost because no one prays for them, but they don't have to be lost, but they, but they are lost. I mean, that's the terrible drama of life is that people do lose their way. They lose their souls, but they can lose their souls. So we fight on. Well, that's an interesting thing I was going to ask. As bad as the, you know, as badly off as we seem in the culture war today, how how do we compare to, say, early persecutions of the church? You'd say, well, the culture was a lot worse then. But I wonder what the actual battle for souls. I wonder I wonder which which in which case we're worse off because we're kind of apathetic now. Um, and we're not facing bloody persecution, are we losing more souls than when the culture, the culture was actually a lot worse if they were, you know, killing Christians was the culture, but whether fewer souls, Christian souls anyway, um, were lost at that time. Right. The point has been made that it's more difficult now to evangelize because it's a post-Christian situation. Instead of telling people you have to decide between Christ and the pagan gods. Now we're saying you have to decide between Christ and what you think is Christ, but that you've been raised under a false impression of what Christianity is. And it's very hard to dislodge that. There was an older man who had been edu- in one of my parishes who had been educated by the Jesuits on things like liturgy and social justice. And me, a young, uh, more conservative priest comes in and makes some liturgical changes and some of And we were on a very friendly basis. He was on my finance council and a, a good loyal soldier of the church in many ways, but there was just no way, humanly speaking, he was going to change his mind about some of the things that the Jesuits had taught him regarding morality and ecclesiology and liturgy. I just had to accept that because he had been told, he'd been raised in a certain understanding of Christianity in his formative years. And so that's the way it is. There, there, <laughs> there's an older nun that I know who doesn't live in community and doesn't have a really great leader religious life although she still functions as a nun, God bless her. And she said to me one time, you know, Father, I, I really like living alone. <laughs> well, yeah, everybody likes living alone and controlling their environment rather than living in community. <laughs> because she had been taught after Vatican II that, you know, none should be in the world, live in apartments. Uh, so I don't think that will ever change in her. And hopefully it's not a deal breaker that she's not endangering her soul irreparably by by not living the religious life really that she was called to. But it there's no way that will change in her her cog, cognitive her, her her mind. Mm-hmm. I think we just have to accept that about the culture the cultural battles we're in that we we can't win some of these battles on a human level. Which is kind of another question I have um, with the fact that, you know, we're supposed to distinguish between, not not that any of these people you mentioned are sinners in this sense, but between sins and sinners and, you know, evil and evildoers, but in fact, evil is carried out in the world by people. And you talked about um, this columnist who 
could see the good even in the German soldiers and see them as human beings. But today, evil is carried out by human beings. So how do we distinguish? Like, I just found out that another one of my neighbors is an abortionist. And we already knew there was one in the neighborhood. So now there's another one. And, you know, she, she is one of the people who carries out. She kills babies with a rare hands, late term babies. And how do you balance that between, okay, she is a human being who has value. She's a child of God, but she is one of the people responsible for this, these evils um, today. Yeah, that's always the tricky thing is to see the goodness in people when there's great evil. But Ernie Pyle, the journalist you referenced, who almost died several times at the hands of the Germans and eventually died at the hands of the Japanese, saw the goodness in them. I think that was his Christian legacy. He had been raised to see the world sacramentally. I, I think he was raised Protestant, but still the Christian tradition. So acknowledging the evil, but um, acknowledging the good too. There's If there is a, something in a person, that something is good. Evil is the, the lack of existence, the, the lack of, um, it's, it's, a, it's a vacuum. So <laughs> what she does, she vacuums out the skulls of children. And, but there is goodness in her that we, we acknowledge, we give thanks to God for. So in this kind of a war, I, I don't see it as really different than the German soldiers who were uh, brutalizing people because they've been told to do so. This woman, this abortionist has been told since she was a teenager, a little girl probably, that a it is good to um, evacuate a woman's womb that doesn't want to be so-called burdened by pregnancy. She has been raised to believe that. And there was apparently no convicting counter argument to that in her formation. Same thing with, with the German soldiers. We went through the German cemetery outside of Caratan in Normandy and it's so touching to see the graves. There's, I think about uh, 25,000 German soldiers in a cemetery that's about one tenth the size of the American cemetery, which has 10,000 soldiers. But many of them, it just says, Ein Deutsche Soldat, one, you know, a German soldier. Or some of them would have like zwei Deutsche Soldaten, two or three German soldiers, no name. And it just made you think, these, these boys came from Germany to defend the motherland as they'd been instructed to do. And they ended up in this hole in, in Normandy without any uh, name on their gravestone. So uh, you try to see all people as human beings and in themselves are victims of the demonic evil that really is behind all of these cultural battles. Right. Um, last question. Do you think a sense of humor is a virtue? Yes, it is. <laughs> um, not a, I just recently read a book uh, about, it's called, well, it's by Peter Kreeft, and it's, I think it's called Ha, H-A. It's a theology of humor, jokes <laughs> and laughter. And Peter Kreeft goes, it, it's, a, it's just a little book. But he says it's probably the most important book I've ever written. You know, a man that's written probably 70 or 80 books on theology and philosophy. But the theology of humor, only the human person can laugh. No other animal can laugh. And when we laugh in good humor, we are acknowledging a greater good than any evil. So that's a statement of faith. Laughter is a statement of you know, good laughter, wholesome pure laughter is a statement of God's providence.